Hello and happy day. How does slowing down sound to you today? Would you like to reduce the noise for just a bit? Are you ready to make a choice and decide to listen? My name is Igor S.F. Walker and I'm here to remind people to slow down, to reduce the noise, to walk their lives into a natural flow. Welcome back to the Book of the Week series. Every week as I read another amazing title, I share it with the world. And today we look at PEAK, The Secrets from the New Science of Expertise by Anders Ericsson and Robert Poole. How do people take advantage of the brain's adaptability? Both the brain and the body are more adaptable in young children than in adults. So there are certain abilities that can only be developed or that are more easily developed before the age of 6 or 12 or 18. Still, both the brain and the body retain a great deal of adaptability throughout adulthood. And this adaptability makes it possible for adults, even older adults, to develop a wide variety of new capabilities with the right training. See, people assume that continued driving or tennis playing or pie baking is a form of practice and that if they keep on doing it, they're bound to get better at it. Slowly perhaps, but nevertheless better. They assume that someone who has been driving for 20 years must be a better driver than someone who has been driving for five. That a doctor who has been practicing medicine for 20 years must be better than the doctor who has been practicing for five. That a teacher who has been teaching for 20 years must be better than the one who has been teaching for five. But no, research has shown that generally speaking, once a person reaches that level of acceptable performance automaticity, the additional years of practice don't actually lead to improvement. If anything, the doctor or the teacher or the driver who has been at it for 20 years is likely to be a bit worse than the ones who's been doing it for only five. And the reason is that the automated abilities gradually deteriorate in the absence of deliberate effort to improve. Purposeful practice is a term that, as it implies, has much more purpose. It's much more purposeful, much more thoughtful and focused than this sort of naive, repetitive practice. In particular, it has the following characteristics. Purposeful practice has well-defined specific goals. Purposeful practice is all about putting in a bunch of baby steps together to reach a longer-term goal. Purposeful practice is focused and it involves feedback. It requires getting out of one's comfort zone, and this is perhaps the more important part of purposeful practice. This is a fundamental truth about any sort of practice. If you never push yourself beyond your comfort zone, you never will improve. The best way to get past any barrier is to come at it from a different direction, which is one reason it is useful to work with a teacher or a coach. There's no easy way to observe the resulting changes in your brain as it adapts to the increasing demands being placed on it. There's no soreness in your cortex a day after a particularly tough training session. You don't have to go out and buy new hats because the old ones are now too small or too big. You don't develop a six pack on your whole forehead. And because you can't see any changes in your brain, it is easy to assume that really there isn't much going on. And that would be a mistake. However, there's a growing body of evidence that both the structure and the function of the brain change in response to various sorts of mental training in much the same way as your muscles and cardiovascular systems respond to physical training. Although there's still a tremendous amount to learn in this area, we already know enough to have a clear idea of how purposeful practice and deliberate practice work to increase both our physical and mental capabilities and make it possible to do things that we never could do before. See, there's a study that McGuire carried out in London where she compared the brains of taxi drivers with bus drivers. Like the taxi drivers, the bus drivers spent their days driving around London. The difference between them was that, that the bus drivers repeated the same routes over and over again. And this never had to figure out the best way to get from point A to point B. What McGuire found is that the posterior hippocampi, 
of the taxi drivers was significantly larger than the same part of the brain in the bus drivers. The clear implication was that whatever was responsible for the difference in the size of the posterior hippocampi was not related to driving itself, but rather was related specifically to the navigational skills that the job required. See, the brain, like the body, changes most quickly in that sweet spot where it is pushed outside, but not too far outside its comfort zone. Here's the key difference between the traditional approach to learning and the purposeful practice or deliberate practice approach. The traditional approach is not designed to challenge homeostasis. It assumes, continuously, consciously or not, that learning is all about fulfilling your innate potential and that you can develop a particular skill or ability without getting too far out of your comfort zone. In this view, all that you're doing with practice, indeed all that you can do, is reach a fixed potential. With deliberate practice, however, the goal is not just to reach your potential, but to build it, to make things possible that were not possible before. The superior organization of information is a theme that appears over and over and over again in the study of expert performers. The main purpose of deliberate practice is to develop effective mental representations. And mental representations play a key role in deliberate practice. Deliberate practice is different from other sorts of purposeful practice in two important ways. First, it requires a field that is already reasonably well developed. There, that is a field in which the best performers have attained a level of performance that clearly sets them apart from people who are just entering the field. And second, deliberate practice requires a teacher who can provide practice activities designed to help a student improve his or her performance. Deliberate practice develops skills that other people have already figured out how to do and for which effective training techniques have been established. The practice regimen should be designed and overseen by a teacher or a coach who is familiar with the abilities of expert performers and with how those abilities can be best developed. Deliberate practice takes place outside one's comfort zone. It requires a student to constantly try things that are just beyond his or her current abilities. Deliberate practice involves well-defined specific goals and it often involves improving some aspect of the target performance that is not aimed at some vague overall improvement. Deliberate practice is deliberate. That is, it requires a person's full attention and conscious action. It is not enough to simply follow a teacher or a coach's direction. Deliberate practice involves feedback and modification of efforts in response to that feedback. Deliberate practice both produces and depends on effective mental representations. Improving performance goes hand in hand with improving mental representations as one performance improves, the representations become more detailed and effective, in turn making it possible to improve even more. Deliberate practice nearly always includes and involves building or modifying previously acquired skills by focusing on a particular aspect of those skills and working to improve them specifically. Over time, step-by-step -step improvement will eventually lead to expert performance. The first step towards enhancing performance in an organization is realizing that improvement is possible only if participants abandon business as usual practices. Doing so requires recognizing and rejecting three prevailing myths. The first is our old friend that belief that one's abilities are limited by one's genetically prescribed characteristics. That belief manifests itself in all sorts of I can't or I'm not statements. The second myth holds that if you do something for long enough, you're bound to get better at it. Again, we know better. Doing the same thing over and over again is, in exactly the same way, is not a recipe for improvement. It's a recipe for stagnation and gradual decline. The third myth states that it takes all it takes to improve is effort. If you just try hard enough, you will get better. If you want to be a better manager, try harder. If you want to generate more sales, try harder. If you want to improve your teamwork, try harder. 
the reality is, however, that all of these things, managing, selling, teamwork, are specialized skills. And unless you're using practice techniques specifically designed to improve those particular skills, trying hard will not get you far. We can only form effective mental representations when we try to reproduce what the expert performer can do. Fail, figure out why we fail, try again, and repeat over and over again. Please, do help out. It is easy. Simply like this video so more people can enjoy. Share it too and spread the word. Subscribe to my channel and stay up to date. And the link to this book is in the description below. So buy it and read. Never stop learning. Thank you. Love and respect.